This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Hello and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii and It Never Got Quiet. This is a half hour program that explores the Hawaiian connection with the Vietnam War. I'm your host, Vic Kraft. Our guest today has a remarkable record not only in service while in uniform, but as a public servant and one who has committed much of his personal time to volunteer activities. He is Michael Lilly and was commissioned in the U.S. Navy in 1968, sub subsequently serving aboard the USS Waddell and held other positions on shore after sea duty. While aboard the Waddell, he did a tour of um, gunfire line or the gun line off the coast of Vietnam, providing fire support to troops engaged with the enemy or conducting interdiction operations to prevent war material from entering the South from North Vietnam. Michael left active duty but remained in the Naval Reserve, retiring as a captain. His dress uniform displays his accomplishments with the Legion of Merit, Defense Meritorious Service, and Meritorious Service Medals, along with a host of other decorations. During both active duty and reserve time, he served in a number of functions that most people outside of the Navy would call alphabet soup. The one job I found the longest attempt by the Navy for a job title was, I'm going to give this a shot, ComNav Surf Group Mid-Pack for Commander Naval Surface Group Mid-Pacific. There are probably more uh, that are much longer, but maybe not as tongue-twisting. Michael Lilly is a uh, licensed attorney in Hawaii. He served as our Attorney General and First Deputy Attorney General of Hawaii. He has been the state's Chief Law Enforcement o Legal Officer and serving as Chairman of the Governor's Crime Committee. After returning to private practice, Michael pu uh, pushed for a number of issues that earned him the 1999 Outstanding Community Service Award from the National Society of the Daughters of the American Re Revolution and the Helen Canal Wilder Fo Fellowship Award or Friendship Award from the Hawaiian Humane Society. Michael is currently a member of the State of Hawaii Veterans Advisory Board, which recommends programs for veterans, their dependents, and or their survivors, and provides advocacy on behalf of Hawaii's 120,000 veterans. Their objective is to inform veterans about state and federal programs and entitlements. He was a past president of the Navy League's Pacific Region and Honolulu Council, a national director of the <coughs> Navy League, and president of the Naval Reserve Association Pearl Harbor, Pearl Harbor Chapter. He is also fundraising chair of Guide Dogs of Hawaii and has served on the boards of other charities, including Diamond Head Theater. He is currently vice chair of the Honolulu City Ethics Commission. Aloha and welcome, Michael. Welcome to the program. Good to be here, Vic. Nice to see you. How did you have time to breathe through all of these things? My grandmother always said the grass didn't grow under my feet. So, I don't know, I just have a storehouse of energy. I, I find it interesting, uh, you, your roots in Hawaii go back many generations. Yeah, I'm a fifth generation Keiki Oka'aina. Ah, and uh, with, with relatives that had served in the royal government as well. Yeah. And uh, I was just kind of curious as to what made you join the Navy? I mean, wh why that branch as opposed to any of the others? Was there a, a family history? or? That's the easiest one of all. My dad uh, was a retired Navy captain. and. So when I came into this world, I came into a Navy family, and that was going to be my history. I was going to be in, there was no question I was going to be in the Navy, <laughs> as, as did my brother. So uh, that was destined for me. That's great. Uh, you went to school here, of course, and uh, then uh, uh, I don't know if the term is barred or if you were a licensed uh, attorney prior to going into the service or uh, after uh, coming out. 
No, I, I was, after college, I didn't want to study anymore, so I decided I'd, that was the time to go in the Navy. And of course, then when I went to officer candidate school, which is the Navy's officer boot camp, mm -hmm. I never started, studied harder in my whole life. <laughs> so, so I wound up studying harder and harder. But um, by the time that I, I had served in Vietnam and, and, and uh, left active service, I really wanted to do something meaningful. And the law called to me. And mm -hmm. I, so I, I went to law school after that. And then, of course, all my friends that became lawyers said, oh, you have to become a JAG officer. I said, I'm not interested in being a lawyer on the weekends. I want to drive ships. <laughs> so I, I stayed, in the, stayed in the reserve so I could drive ships and, and be operational and not do law stuff. You uh, went ahead and, uh, let's see, you did your OCS time, and we were just talking about it. Uh, you put in for destroyer duty, <laughs> yeah. uh, the greyhounds of the ocean or the greyhounds of the sea. Off Vietnam. Off Vietnam. Uh, being in a confining situation like that, when you're on station, you're surrounded by your crew members all the time, uh, it's unlike shore duty where at least you can get out and grab a bite to eat at a restaurant once in a while. What was it like uh, uh, going on the gun line and uh, doing the active fire support? A, a naval ship is, is a city unto its own. Um, and everybody works together to a common goal uh, and keeping that ship alive and functioning. And it's uh, when you're doing that, you know, you talk about the Band of Brothers, uh, that's the way we were on that ship. We were all one cohesive unit. It was the most marvelous sense of fellowship and purpose that anyone could ever experience. And then in Vietnam, we were on the gun line and, and what we were doing there was supporting the troops ashore, the Marines and the Army. And the most satisfying thing for me was when, uh, when we were call, called up by Marine units or Army units at the top of a hill, being overrun by Viet Cong surrounding them. Uh, we were able to be their mobile artillery, and they would spot our rounds. And many times, we were able to save the lives of units uh, by being their artillery, mm -hmm. which is a very satisfying, obviously a very satisfying experience. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it was a very purposeful experience, uh, and it was one of tremendous fellowship. That's great. That's, that's one of the things that I think we're missing in society today is, is that sense of duty and togetherness as far as working together. Well, you're carrying the flag, and you're carrying uh, the honor of uh, generations before you uh, out there doing the country's business. So. It's, it's a very satisfying, it was a very satisfying experience for me. After sea duty, uh, you had a number of shore assignments, uh, one of which was ComNav Group, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about your shore duty? Well, I was fortunate. I, my dad always said, command, command, command. So. I always aspired to have command, so I, I was fortunate to have five reserve commands in my career, which to me was, uh, other than being aboard a ship, that was the most satisfying thing for me uh, as an officer. But we were in a new world of the Naval Reserve. The Naval Reserve was, was transit, transiting into supporting the active services and doing their job. So instead of drilling on the weekends in a, in a classroom somewhere, we were actually at Sink Pack Fleet mm -hmm. or at Sink Pack or ComNav Surf Crew Mid Pack doing the active duty work alongside of them. Uh, or we would be on a ship and we would be doing everything that an active duty person would do on that ship or on that shore command, only we were helping them do their job. And so this was a, a new world for the reserve. Instead of just being trainees, we were actually hands-on doing the work that, that was necessary so that those commands, whether it's the highest command like Sink Pack or one of the lower commands like ComNav Surf Crew Mid Pack, we were, we were helping them achieve their mission, their active duty mission as reservists. Hmm. That's a, a, a bit different from <coughs> excuse me, some of the other uh, services as far as uh, 
in the Air Force, there are aircraft dedicated to the reserves, uh, Air Guard. Uh, there are assets that are dedicated to those uh, particular units as opposed to being active duty. Yeah, we had some of those in the Navy, but, but primarily when I got off active duty, they were, we were doing our training in classrooms. Mm -hmm. and we got a we've got a, a, a Pearl Harbor full of ships and commands, and we were in a classroom. Fortunately, that changed pretty quickly, and the idea of the reserve being able to not only do uh, work alongside the active duty, but to help them do their jobs uh, was very satisfactory and, and uh, very successful. Something just occurred to me. You were at a, uh, in the service and probably active duty and reserves at a, at a transition time, not only from uh, active duty to reserves, but also from wartime to peacetime. And yeah. I know I was part of that in, in the mid-70s yeah. when we were transitioning from being war fighters into garrison. And it was... Uh, and you remember the, how, how you were treated when you came back? Oh, my goodness, yes. Uh, well, rocks thrown at us, cars... Yeah. Uh, very badly. Sure, we were treated very poorly. Did you have that ex a similar experience here? Very much so. Really? Uh, I, I had a lot of negative uh, experiences, ex especially on weekends when mm -hmm. I put on my uniform. And if I happened to be in the civilian world, uh, I got some very negative uh, reactions to that. And it's kind of an interesting uh, experience. And when I first uh, went to work at the Attorney General's office in the 70s, I was a deputy, one of the deputies. And I would. I would be invited to give a speech at a Rotary or business club or wherever. And I always put down on my resume, Vietnam veteran, you know, combat veteran. And no one ever would introduce me as having anything to do with the military or having been a Vietnam vet. Never happened. It was just bizarre, like it wasn't there on my resume. And then in the early 80s, when I became first deputy attorney general, and I got to do a lot of more speeches in those days. Um, this was when Reagan came in, and it was like things changed. It's, it's a whole feeling about it changed. And suddenly I would be introduced not only as, you know, this is my job, but he's a Vietnam combat veteran, you know, off the coast, all that stuff. So suddenly uh, it was not shameful to be a Vietnam vet. Mm -hmm. And we were actually being recognized for that. Today, it's so much even more different. It's today, they thank you for your service. And that was unheard of in our day, right. that anyone would thank you for, we, you, we may not, you may not agree with why we were there, but we were there serving our country, we we're doing our duty, we, we saluted and, and carried it out the best of our ability, but uh, we weren't making the decision where to go, we were just doing our job. Today, uh, if you disagree with us being in other war zones in Afghanistan, the general feeling is, thank you for your service. And that's wonderful. I think you're, it's absolutely it's great. It's a real change. Yes, it is a change. Uh, and I think it's a, a, it's a, it's a feeling of togetherness yeah. that uh, I wish uh, we could uh, can and sell. Yes, we have more of it. <laughs> Let's have more of it. Yeah. We're going to take a break here and, uh, for some messages, and we'll be right back. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. But I have a story, and I don't know where to start. I still have nightmares. I feel overwhelmed. I can't live like this anymore. I'm really not so good. But are you ready to listen? My friend, Mother, what big eyes you have. She said, all the better to see you with, my dear. That's What are you doing? Okay, cool. Research says reading from birth accelerates the baby's brain development. And you're doing that now? Oh, yeah, ah. yeah this is the starting line. Hush. Ah. Ah. When this is over, you're dead. Read aloud 15 minutes. Every child, every parent, every day. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion. Nothing is making sense. For me and you Maybe we can find a way There's got to be solution How to make a brighter day What do we do? We've got to give a little love Have a little hope Make this world a little better Try a little more Harder than before 
Welcome back. We're here with Michael Lilly, and we're discussing his uh, experiences in Vietnam and uh, post-Vietnam. And uh, I'd kind of like to get right into that, Michael. And that is, right now, uh, just as of today, there are an awful lot of homeless veterans. Uh, I'd kind of like to know, can you explain to me what the state is doing? I know that we're, we're building some communities out there using uh, uh, temporary sea vans uh, and putting them on pads. And, but I think it's angered an awful lot of veterans uh, who feel that some of these folks haven't really done their duty. They're being given something for nothing. Uh, basically, a lot of them, I, I don't want to broad brush uh, the, the whole community, but uh, perhaps maybe through their life's choices, they ended up here. Mm -hmm. Whereas an awful lot of veterans uh, seem to have been kind of <coughs> pushed out of the way, uh, fallen through the crack. Is there anything that the state's doing as far as uh, screening people or finding those folks and trying to do something for them? I think that's the good news story. Um, as, as you know, I'm on the Hawaii Governor's uh, Advisory Board to Veterans Services. And at the state level, we work with the Veterans Administration on all programs both state and federal, uh, for veterans. In the homeless uh, area, we're in Hawaii, we're among the lowest. And we've had a good news of uh, getting veterans off the streets and into homes, uh, into temporary f facilities, getting the treatment they need. The difficulty, a lot of times, is, uh, is in outreach, mm -hmm. finding them. Uh, but we're out there working on that. Uh, they come, they get get uh, serviced by the Veterans Administration. That's one way we get uh, get the word and we can, we can help them. Uh, we help them with the counseling. Uh, sometimes they, they just they need a handout, they need a, friend, a friendly face, uh, they have somebody they can talk to, and, and somebody can help them with what programs there are out there, both state and federal levels, that can help these folks. Because by and large, as you know, a, a veteran is someone who's done the job, demonstrated they can do it, uh, they're, they're hardworking. Uh, some of them have had difficulty financially or with drugs or, or sometimes PS, PSBT and things like, you know, post-traumatic stress. So um, we're out there working uh, in that area and I, I just say that the number of homeless uh, among veterans in Hawaii is among the lowest in the nation uh, and going in the right direction. We're getting fewer veterans out there on the streets. That's great. I, I know that uh, uh, retired Colonel Ron Hahn, who's the director of the Veteran Services yeah. here, yeah. Uh, is up in the E-Wing as a tripler and uh, yeah. uh, actively working towards uh, these projects. Well, uh, we just, report to him. Uh, uh, he's, the, he's the state side of, the, yeah. of our board. Yeah. So we meet with him every month and go over these very issues uh, because uh, we are the state advocates, we on the board, Mm -hmm. The governor put us there to ad be the advocates for the 120,000 veterans in Hawaii uh, and their families. So it's more than just the veterans; it's their, it's their, uh, their wives, their husbands, their children, their relatives. Uh, all the services uh, were their advocates in the state. Curiously, uh, I know the state of California has what's called CalVets and uh, they offer uh, low interest housing uh, loans, uh, various other programs, if you're a California veteran, or that was your uh, uh, home of registry or uh, home of record. Uh, does Hawaii have anything similar? We have similar programs. You can, you can get funds, for example, to remodel your house mm -hmm. um, if you're a disabled vet, mm -hmm. uh, so that it's, it can, you can use your house, you're disabled, and be able to use it. So, there are a variety of programs like that out there. Um, and a lot of times veterans don't even know what they are. In fact, when I became a member of the advisory board, I found out about programs I didn't even know about. And here, you know, this is something that we're trying to get the word out to the vets. And outreach uh, is a major, it's a major part of our task. Yeah, I, I know that uh, uh, from the, the VA side, uh, where the rubber meets the road, they're very dependent upon the vet centers uh, and the mobile vet center. And uh, I, don't, I don't know if the state has budgeted anything like that or something similar to that. I would think that uh, in order to get out there as far as the outreach, 
just walking around sometimes might do it, going through some of these homeless parks that we have and start talking to people. Uh, yeah. You know. Yeah, some of that's going on. Some yeah. of that's going on. So uh, it's, uh, it's a difficult yeah. task. It's a very oh, it's difficult enormous. task. It's an enormous task. One of the things that I discovered, and I, I ran into a vet one time, a homeless vet, uh, I offered to take him to the vet center and, and let's go get in the car, let's go down there so we can see what we can do for you. He said, no, I've got a bad conduct discharge. There are an awful lot of these veterans who got into situations where third tour, fourth tour from Afghanistan or Iraq, got involved in a DUI or got into some Article 15 problems or disciplinary issues, subsequently getting a bad conduct discharge. Is the state doing anything as far as helping some of these guys, yeah. some advocacy for them? Yes, we do. Super. We do. We do. How we do they do. get a hold of them? How, how does how do these well, people? Yeah. That's all, well. There, there's a lot of ways in which they can get a hold of us, mm -hmm. um, either on the internet or by phone, or through these vet centers. Uh, the difficult part, the task is us to go out and find these people. Yeah. So that's, and you know, budgeting and and personnel, those are difficult issues. But they're ones that we're we're challenged by, and and we're we're working with. Super. Yeah. And you know the, the whole array of VA benefits uh, is also open to all vets, and getting uh, it, the word out to them in a way. You know the the new choice program is making it simpler for a vet to be able to get medical services, whereas before it was very difficult to to be able to get a medical mm -hmm. service, and, and now it's a little more seamless. And so we think all the trajectories are in the right direction. That's super. <coughs> Excuse me. I don't know. It's uh, given your life's example uh, and what you've done and what you've accomplished, not only uh, in service but also service to community uh, in, in government and in private sector. I kind of feel that you offer up one heck of an example to uh, the population. Thank you for that. And uh, but it's it's amazing that you've put these goals in front of you. Do you think that that's part of what we need to instill in people? Uh, well, I think the, the military provides you with the kind of values uh, and discipline and, and, and uh, attention to detail uh, that can, be, can help drive you in whatever direction you want to go. So a lot of what I've done I attribute to my time in the military, which I always say, my, my going into the Navy and going to Vietnam was transformational in, in a hugely positive way. I was not the same person going in that I came out. When I left Vietnam, I was light years from what, what I was <laughs> as a college graduate going to Vietnam. And I mean in a very positive way. Yeah. And my life, uh, everything, I say everything that I have been able to do uh, I, I trace back to that transformational experience. And I always get, and I, I get a little bit of chicken skin right now, I get so much more reward being able to do things for others and for as many people as I can than I ever get as a lawyer making money. So, you know, you make money, fine. But there's, there's, it's, that's transitory, that's really illusory. What really motivates me and what I feel is my own reward is the things that I've been able to do for others, whether as a reserve captain, as a captain of a reserve unit, I was mentoring my subordinate uh, enlisted personnel and officers so that they could advance and excel in their lives, uh, or now on the advisory board trying to help the homeless veterans and other veterans out there that don't even know what programs are out there available for them to deal with their issues. I tell you, those are more rewarding than anything else in life other than my kids and my wife. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny because I, before my son went into the service, I told him, I said, you'll never have another job that's as satisfying. Yeah, you're... And it's... Uh, yes. I, I don't know if he agrees with me still, but... <laughs> I bet he will in time. I bet he will. I hope so. I hope so. We would love to have some feedback, and we are also looking for people to interview. 
If you have some comments or would like to appear on the program, please send us an email at 808vietnamvets at gmail.com. I'm especially looking forward to uh, speaking with pilots, uh, particularly Huey pilots, if I can find some. Uh, their uh, view on the war would be something uh, to, to take a look at. I would like to thank the staff here at Think Tech Hawaii for all their support and assistance. Truly, without them, this program would not be possible. Please come back again next week for another issue of It Never Got Quiet. Mahalo.